Nothing captures a sense of vulnerability that comes with being a college student like Chika Umino's Honey and Clover. Honey and Clover is a manga about people who are lost and stuck in life, about people who are no longer children but not quite adults yet either. It's a story about leaving and staying behind and what that does to your relationships with others. And it's a story about the kind of all-encompassing, intimate friendships that you don't get at any other stage of your life. Friendships that are at once wholesome and yet somehow have this disturbing edge to them. At its core, Honey and Clover is a manga that interrogates a single question. What is worth holding on to and when should you let go? Hello, my name is Sean and I break down what makes great stories tick. In chapter 17, Yuta Takemoto gets the feeling that this might be the last Christmas he'll celebrate with his friends together from college, with the entire group being all there. Their college, an art school, in the rural parts of Tokyo. Takemoto has this wistful realization here about the fleeting, ephemeral nature of college life. Because for the past two years, Takemoto has shared his entire life with these people. They might have started out as complete strangers, but over time they grew increasingly close as they laughed together, cried together, struggled to make ends meet, fell in love. And by now, they're together all the time, as if that's the most natural thing in the world. But Takamoto realizes that soon all of them will inevitably graduate and go their separate ways. Soon, all these days together will become nothing more than a distant memory. But here's the thing. At this point, the story is only about 20% finished. As it turns out, none of these people actually leave when their college days are supposed to be over. Ayumi Yamada lingers around for at least three years as a postgraduate. Shinobu Morita stretches out his degree for eight whole years. And then, when he finally graduates, he just starts a new degree. And even Takamoto himself has to stay for an extra year because of medical circumstances. Then there's Takumi Mayama, the one person in the group who actually graduates and finds a job. But even he keeps living in his squalid student accommodation and hanging out with his college friends and former professor. And as the most extreme case of all, there's Shuji Hanamoto, a former student who stayed around campus for so long that he's now a professor at that very institution. There's a particular moment where this disconnect is brought to light really poignantly. At the end of the academic year, the aged Professor Tange complains that teaching is a thankless profession. After all, while teachers get so invested in their students, those very same students, well, they just graduate and move on. Once they graduate, you don't see them again for years. Some of them you never meet again, ever. And yet, we see something very different on the panel with this speech. We see four former students who have already graduated or who should have graduated years ago and yet never really left the confines of campus. You see, college is normally a liminal period, a time of transition between childhood and adulthood, a time to grow and develop, but one that you're eventually supposed to leave behind, however bittersweet that may be. But for the cast of Honey and Clover, the eternal college students, this has gone horribly wrong. They have become trapped and turned into a permanent residence of this in-between world. Okay, so let me take a step back and actually introduce the central premise of Honey and Clover. This is a story about essentially seven characters and two love triangles. The story starts when Yuta Takemoto, a second year student who's struggling to find his place in life, falls in love with the first year student, Hagumi Hanamoto, who's nicknamed Hagu. And she's this artistic prodigy, and also the cousin of Professor Hanamoto. But 
Takamoto is not the only person who fell in love with Hagu, because one other guy fell for her at the very same time. And that's Takamoto's eccentric but talented flatmate Shinobu Morita, who regularly disappears for weeks on end for secretive jobs, and who may or may not be involved in the mysterious scheme to save Japan with the help of a magical cell phone. And just to be clear, that last part's a joke. Then we get the story's second love triangle, which involves Takemoto and Morita's other flatmate, Takumi Mayama. Mayama is the object of the ceramics major Ayumi Yamada's affections, but Mayama can't reciprocate her feelings for him, because he in turn has fallen head over heels for the widowed architect Rika Harada, who has been a close friend of Professor Hanamoto's since their own college days. Now, I know that this is a lot of names and relationships to take in, so here's this diagram I put together where everything is kind of in place. But what's strange, kind of unsettling even, about these love triangles is how little progress anyone actually makes in them for the majority of the manga. And that's especially remarkable because of the vast amount of time that passes over the course of the series. The story of Honey and Clover takes place over a four-year period, which actually coincides with the duration of a full degree at Honey and Clover's art school. So just let this sink in for a moment. The characters of Honey and Clover hold on to their one-sided crushes for the time span that's the equivalent of an entire college degree. And even though most of them know that their feelings will never be reciprocated, they just can't bring themselves to let go and move on. And all this then brings us to the fundamental question that underpins the entire series. What is worth holding on to and when should you let go? Honey and Clover explores this question by using its different characters as vehicles to interrogate the value of friendship, of art, of love, and even of life itself. Let me start by examining the actual group dynamics here. Honey and Clover revolves around a tight-knit friend group, which is tangled up in this extremely complicated web of romantic tensions. There's this one scene in particular that illustrates just how awkward this entire situation has become. The five of them go ride a ferris wheel, and for that they have to split up into two groups. And you see this sense of sheer terror at the thought of being locked up alone with their crush for 19 full minutes. Of course then, they actually end up with the worst possible combination, and the whole experience becomes awkward and miserable for everyone. And at certain moments, their relationships with each other even seem outright toxic. There's one point where Mayama's colleagues take notice of Yamada's works, and they start commissioning pottery from her. Mayama, however, does everything in his power to stop his attractive senior colleague Nomiya from getting to know her. Mayama is absolutely paranoid about Nomiya seducing Yamada, and he tries to take control of Yamada's love life in the process. And that even though he has rejected Yamada multiple times over the course of this series. Nomiya at one point hits the nail on the head here. He notes that Mayama doesn't actually want Yamada to move on. She's basically his backup plan in case that he doesn't get his way with Rika. So all this then begs the question why these people keep seeking each other out all this time nonetheless? Why doesn't someone like Yamada just cut off the source of her unrequited feelings and move on? The thing is, when all is said and done, the characters in Honey and Clover genuinely love and care for each other, albeit sometimes in imperfect and unhealthy ways. For instance, when Takamoto reaches his fourth year, he hits the lowest point of his life so far. He's feeling lost about his future, failing to find a job, and all of his misery and despair manifests itself in this wobbly tower that he builds for the annual student art exhibition. And this story of Takamoto's tower is conveyed without words on the cover pages of four consecutive chapters. 
we watch Takamoto laboring on his fragile tower. We get a sense of impending doom through a bird's eye shot. And then we see Takamoto lying on the floor, seemingly collapsed from exhaustion. And this is foreshadowing, by the way. And finally, when he wakes up, he finds himself in Professor Hanamoto's office, with Hagu making him breakfast. But it's only once Takamoto collapses for real and gets hospitalized that he realizes what has been happening right before his eyes. Hagu, this girl who will never reciprocate his feelings, has been there for him all this time. She had been watching over him, taking care of him, and worrying about him for the entire process. And Takamoto had just been oblivious to all of this. This is the kind of thing that makes the relationships in Honey and Clover so complicated. It's cast as this group of friends who genuinely lean on each other and constantly have each other's back. We have to realize that many of them are on their own for the first time in their life, and so they become something like a surrogate family for each other. And as a result, their relationships with each other are this bittersweet, unhealthy cocktail of emotions. You want them to never part ways, even though you know deep inside that this would be better for them in the long run. We see an even more extreme form of these tensions in the relationship between Professor Hanamoto and Rika. The two of them grew close in a very similar way during their days as students at that very same art school. Both of them were struggling in their new environments, until they befriended a guy called Harada. The three of them ended up living together until the day that Harada and Rika got married. And looking back, Hanamoto realizes that it was Harada who saved both of them. But one day, Harada and Rika were driving home and hit by a truck. Harada was killed in the accident, whereas Rika survived but was left with scars all over her body and a permanent disability. And as becomes increasingly clear over the course of the story, neither Rika nor Hanamoto ever came to terms with the loss of Harada. Since the death of her husband, Rika has obsessively dedicated her life to completing the projects that she and Harada left behind. Whereas Hanamoto could never move on from the college where he had met his best friend. But at the same time, the loss of Harada also changed the relationship between Hanamoto and Rika. After the accident, Hanamoto moved in with Rika for a while, out of fear that her grief would be too much for her to bear. But as they're together, we see that they're just dragging each other down, because being together only makes them relive their memories of Harada. And what's even worse is that seeing Rika's suffering convinces Hanamoto that she might actually be better off joining her husband on the other side. Until one day, Hanamoto almost took fate in his own hands. At this point, it becomes clear to both of them that they need to go their separate ways. So, despite their clear, deep love for each other, they just can't stay together any longer. Now, it's important to note here that Honey and Clover in many ways presents the relationship between Harada, Rika, and Hanamoto as a parallel to the group in the present day story. So, when the manga explicitly spells out that there are times when even the closest of friends are better off being apart, it also raises this question in relationship to its main cast. So, it asks if someone like Yamada, for example, might be better off as well if she parted ways with Mayama. And in many cases, Honey and Clover's answer is a resounding yes. In fact, its most important moments of growth consistently involve someone leaving the suffocating comfort blanket that is college. Specifically, they have to leave the physical space of the college campus. We get one of the most suitable metaphors for these eternal college students in the opening of chapter 48. Here, we're told that Yamada collects snow globes, which she describes specifically as small, enclosed worlds. So, by implication, 
it means that these are not too different from Yamada's own small sheltered existence that only revolves around her seemingly never-ending studies and her unrequited love for Mayama. But over the course of this chapter, the manga expands on the snow globe metaphor in quite complicated ways. This is actually one of Chika Umino's greatest talents as a writer. She's a master at using imagery and metaphors as structuring devices to organically weave together all the manga's disparate plot threads. So then, on the second page of this chapter, Yamada's reflections on the beauty of snow globes are placed on top of Rika staring at her computer screen. As it turns out, Rika also has this little landscape that she gazes at from beyond the plastic. Specifically, she's always watching this weather camera from her hometown in Hokkaido, to which she hasn't returned since the death of her husband. So we get this pairing of Yamada's snow globes and Rika. And through that, it segues to the association between Rika and snow that has been made at earlier points of the story. For one, in her student days, Rika was known as the Ice Queen. But more tragically, this traffic accident that scarred her for life was caused by heavy snowfall. And what's more, the first flashback in the series to Rika's past was prompted during a visit to the zoo. And that chapter, in turn, ends with an image of a giraffe among the falling snow, locked up all alone for eternity and it's compared to a dinosaur entering the Ice Age. So, with all of this, the manga suggests that Rika has similarly been frozen in time, unable to keep up with her changing circumstances. So then, all these associations, snow, landscapes beyond reach, confined spaces, with all of this, the manga prompts a comparison between Yamada and Rika, and implies that Yamada's life has actually also frozen to a halt in the same way. But right after that, the frozen time starts moving forwards. Mayama's now former colleague Nomiya calls Yamada from his current workplace in Totori, which is about nine hours away from Tokyo. And despite Yamada's best efforts to keep up a brave front, Nomiya immediately sees through her fake cheer. And as soon as he puts down the phone, he jumps into his car and drives all the way to Tokyo. And with Nomiya leaving, the chapter concludes with the first step to end Yamada's confinement. In the next chapter, she will leave Tokyo for the first time in the series. And with that, she's literally moving away from the small snow globe-like world that revolves around her unrequited crush. This is a pattern that recurs time and again throughout Honey and Clover. Rika, for one, can only move on when Mayama brings her back to her hometown. And then there's Hanamoto, the man who keeps failing to properly go away. This characteristic of Hanamoto is also signposted, anticipated, by a flashback to his student days. Hanamoto tried to go and find himself seven whole times, but Harada and Rika kept getting worried and bringing him back home. So on the one hand, this is just a funny gag, but also it's a tale that ironically anticipates how his relationship with Harada and Rika is still keeping him trapped in that very same campus, that very same college, all these years later. There's also an early part of the story where Hanamoto embarks on a year-long research trip to Mongolia, but this trip gets cut short because Hanamoto can't bear being separated from Hagu. He can't bear this change. And so, it's all the more impactful that Hanamoto, at the end of the story, is finally able to leave college and to move on from everything that has shackled him to this point. But by far the most notable instance of a character growing by leaving their old life behind is Takamoto. Takamoto repeats his final year, but even then, he just doesn't manage to find a way forwards. Takamoto experiences failure upon failure, until finally, there's the last straw. One day, Takamoto gets offered a job, out of the blue. A miracle! But 
just when everyone gets together to celebrate, it turns out that Takamoto's employer has just gotten into major financial trouble. And so, Takamoto's job prospects evaporate into thin air. Takamoto is now broken beyond repair. He's got nothing to show for himself after all these years. No job, no self-confidence, no luck in love. Nothing but pure emptiness. And so, he jumps onto his bike and leaves just like that, without any gear, any plan or destination in mind. The only thing that drives him is a silly childhood dream, where he was on a bike and wondered how far he could get without looking back. I'm gonna be honest here, Takamoto's journey is by far my favorite part of the story. I'm a sucker for the sense of romanticism and adventure that Honey and Clover captures so perfectly in the way that Takamoto expands his horizons, and the way that he grows into a real, proper man after he returns. Towards the start of the trip, Takamoto has to enter this terrifying tunnel where he's practically touching the adjacent traffic. This is of course a barrier that reflects Takamoto's figurative tunnel vision, his fear of the future, that has held him captive all these years. But now, Takamoto manages to pass through the tunnel, and once he comes out, he can finally gaze up at the sky. But one day, Takamoto's bike breaks down, and with this, it seems like his journey is about to come to an abrupt conclusion. But by an incredible strike of fortune, he happens to meet a group of traveling temple restorers. He ends up spending a few weeks working for them, saving up money to repair his bike. But it's more than that. For the first time in his life, he feels like he's found a place where he belongs. And indeed, at the end of the story, this is where he ends up working. All good things come to an end, however. His boss sends him off after a few weeks. After all, Takamoto still has this journey to complete. But this time, he doesn't leave with empty hands, like when he left his home in Tokyo. Shin, the man who took Takamoto in, gifts him a physical manifestation of his growth in the form of a new bicycle. This is the moment where Shin reveals that he had undertaken a journey quite like Takemoto's in the past as well. Now we come to the climax of this storyline, which I personally consider one of the greatest works of manga ever created. I've rarely come across anything that showcases the incredible strengths of the medium of manga like chapter 45 of Honey and Clover. So be warned here because I'm going to gush about this one chapter for a few solid minutes right now. At the start of the chapter, we're shown that Takamoto has not inherited just Shin's bike, but also the map that traces Shin's journey all those years ago. And so, Takamoto's destination, the end of Japan, is no longer a pipe dream. What started as an act of desperation has now turned into a feasible goal, with the roadmap guiding his way. In Takamoto's view, the lines and dots that demarcate the stages of Shin's journey are like a constellation. It's as if some ancient wisdom has been passed down to him, like how in the distant past, travelers used the stars as their guides. So, Takamoto follows the figurative constellations on his map, until suddenly he witnesses a new star to guide his way. He sees a train passing by, with an image of the Big Dipper. And it turns out here that this isn't just any train. It's a train to Sapporo, a train that his father had promised to ride with him one day years ago. But this promise never came true, since Takamoto's father passed away when Takamoto was still a young boy. And here, I need you to visualize how these panels look in the printed edition of the manga. On the right page, Takamoto sees the train, the train he associates with his father passing by while he's resting. Just like how Takamoto's father had passed away and left his son behind. But as your eyes move from the right to the left page, you see how Takamoto has jumped on his bicycle and seems to have caught up with this train. 
this time around, Takamoto won't lose sight of his father's star. He's grown strong enough to no longer be left behind, and he's dead set to make good on their promise from all these years ago. But Takamoto is gazing at this train, and that means he loses sight of the roads and eventually stumbles. He's lying there on the ground, but instead of being lost now, he witnesses a magnificent view unfolding right before his eyes. He sees not a single star or constellation, but the entire Milky Way. A sight that humbles even his father's single bright star. But all of this is put into relief on the next page. Because here, we're not getting these high-flown philosophical reflections, but a focus on Takamoto's most rudimentary movements. Takamoto is someone who's already spent a lifetime doubting and wavering. But now, he's able to pick himself up when he stumbles and stand on his own two feet. After all, this journey has taught him that all you have to do to move forward is just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And then we get this leftmost panel. It's narrow, but not confining. It shows us that there's a long journey ahead, but simultaneously, it gives the impression that there's an end point in sight, signposted by the stars themselves. All this is followed by a montage of incredibly narrow snapshots of Takamoto's journey, of all these small adventures that he had on the way, all these small things that he's now actively taking in instead of being locked in his tunnel vision. But these narrow shots slowly turn into wide, full-length panels, and then capped off by this stunning double-page spread to demarcate the moment when Takamoto reaches the very end of Japan. It's absolutely breathtaking how Umino manages to communicate Takamoto's growth through her paneling and artwork alone. We see this trapped, confined world opening up and a transformation from night to day, from dark to light, from rain to shine. For the first time in his life, Takamoto has reached the place where the rain ends. And while the first half of Takamoto's journey required the span of an entire manga volume to tell, his return home takes only three pages. In this way, the complete collapse of story time, and by that I mean the amount of time that the manga dedicates to depicting its events in relationship to the fabula time, which is the amount of time that passes in a narrative, this difference indicates that Takamoto's long, arduous journey has now come to a close. So a lot of Honey and Clover is about people who desperately need to move on. But the story puts this message into relief. It complicates it. Through this one character who has the exact opposite problem. This is Shinobu Morita, the ball of chaotic energy with artistic talent coming out of his ears. Morita is a person who keeps chasing after every shiny new thing that happens to catch his attention rather than finishing what he started. Morita is also the only person in the series who stands on even footing with Hagu as an artist. Hagu genuinely admires his work, and she even gets competitive with him, which is something she just doesn't have with anyone else in the story. In fact, the prospect of meeting someone like Morita was what brought this lonely artistic genius to Tokyo in the first place. And the same is true vice versa. Morita also sees Hagu as the first person with talent rivaling his own greatness. And so it's not surprising that this mutual attraction also manifests on a romantic level. Hagu might not be quite aware of her exact feelings for Morita, but it's undeniable that she has in a way fallen in love with him. So then, of all the potential romances in Honey and Clover, this is the one that seems most likely to be going somewhere. But the thing is with Morita, just like with his artwork, he can't commit to anything in his personal life either. He's constantly disappearing for long stretches of time. And by doing so, he's keeping his relationship with Hagu unresolved. There's one scene where Takamoto is watching Morita flying off, 
and he shouts after him. Morita is, after all, the person who has everything that Sakamoto could possibly want in the palm of his hand. And yet, he just casts it all aside and loses it in the process. Morita just isn't the person who will be there through thick and thin for the girl he loves. The way he sees it, that's Hanamoto's job, not his. And for that reason, the end of the series makes it clear that he isn't the person who can truly give Hagu what she needs. During her final student art exhibition, Hagu gets struck by a panel of glass and ends up in the hospital. Here, her worst fears become reality. The nerves in her right hand are severed, and with that, she might lose her ability to paint forever. Hagu will need months, maybe even years, of physical therapy to recover, and she can't lose hope throughout the entire process. And so what she desperately needs is the support of those around her. After all, how could she possibly make it if her closest friends desert her or lose hope as well? This is quite interesting, right, on a thematic level, because up to this point, Honey and Clover has been mostly a story about people who are stuck in their ways and desperately need to move on. But at the very end of the manga, it turns this whole idea on its head. This time, Agu needs a person to stay with her for the long haul. In other words, the qualities that the series mostly presents as faults are suddenly turned into a virtue. We're given a situation that should make the eternal college students of Honey and Clover truly shine. But, of course, here Morita's attitude towards love and life falls short. Instead of supporting Hagu through the grueling process, what he tries to do is solve the problem by throwing a stack of cash at her. He's essentially looking for a quick fix. And on an emotional level, he similarly offers her a different solution to her despair as well. He tells her that she could also just call it quits. She could also give up painting forever. She could become like him. She could become someone who never finishes what he starts. But by this point, the manga has already shown us that Hagu could never make such a decision. We've learned that long ago, she had an almost religious experience where she made a vow to dedicate her life to creating art. So, when the story challenges Hagu's dedication to her art, she realizes that this is something she absolutely can't let go of. There's simply no other way for her to live her life. And more than that, Hagu's tenacity actually ends up saving Morita instead of how you expect Moita may be saving Hagu. It's her strength that teaches him that calling it quits is the easy way out. And now, for the first time in Morita's life, he feels like he has to make an effort and create something to show for himself. Something to make Hagu proud. So, even though Hagu was going through the darkest moments of her life, she passes on the light that made her who she is today on to Morita. And if you find this inspiring, there's one thing that you shouldn't leave behind. This channel. I make in-depth MAGA analysis every other week. So if you like what you're seeing, consider subscribing for more like this in the future. Hagu is an interesting case regarding the significance of journeys in her own way as well. Before her accident, she intended to return to her hometown in the countryside after graduation, rather than going out into the world to seek fame as an artist. In truth, she realizes that she has been leaning on her cousin, on Professor Hanamoto, all this time, and she can't bear the thought of being a burden on him any longer. So she's actually one of the few people who did plan to leave college. But she's going backwards, not forwards. But during her hospitalization, it becomes clear that returning to how things used to be was never a real option. Because she's visited by her father, who's been absent for most of her life, and introduced to his new wife. And this meeting shatters all her naive beliefs about the possibility of simply going back to how it was. 
So with all this, Honey and Clover offers examples of when to hold on and when to let go. But there's one storyline that really complicates this dichotomy. That's the one of Mayama. In Honey and Clover, love is generally depicted as something pure and innocent. It's the kind of series where you want everyone to get together and to find happiness. Except one case, with Mayama's love for Rika. Mayama is not cute in the same way as all those other characters with their unrequited love. He's outright creepy, because he's basically a stalker. Let me just list a few of the things he does throughout the series. He, for a while, regularly sits outside Rika's apartment at night and peers into her window. He admits that he might assault her. He takes advantage of her disability to lock her into a car and drives off with her. He enters her house without consent. He listens in on her in her living quarters. He looks through her internet history. He pushes her onto a train. Let's not make light of this. All of these acts are a crime. And for all intents and purposes, Mayama should be in jail. So we get quite the heavy contrast, right, between Mayama basically stalking Rika and Yamada having her innocent, pure love for Mayama. It seems very clear who we should be cheering on, at least at first. As the series progresses, however, it turns out that Mayama's persistence is a thing that's justified by the narrative, not Yamada's. Now, just to make this clear up front, I in no way personally condone Mayama's actions. None of this would be justified in real life. We're reading a work of fiction here, and a work of fiction that sometimes crosses into very great territory. My only purpose here is to interpret the themes and messages of this manga to the best of my abilities. Now, even though most everyone in Honey and Clover is stuck with unrequited love for an incredibly long time, the manga explores the question of holding on to a hopeless love most deeply with Yamada's character. In fact, Mayama tells her straight out that she should just give up hope that it will ever work out between them as early as her introduction chapter. We're given to understand that this ship has sunk before we can even follow its voyage. And Yamada is arguably also the character who suffers most heavily from her unresolved feelings. This is most apparent from the way she drowns her sorrows with alcohol time and again. So, for most of this series, Yamada is just locked into this hopeless, one-sided love that only spirals downwards in the process. There's one metaphor that really captures the consequences of Yamada's inability to move on. One day, there's a typhoon, and that snaps one of Yamada's plants in two. Her mother tells her to break off the bent piece. Because if you remove the damaged parts, new leaves will grow in no time at all. And yet, Yamada can't bring herself to do so. To her, it seems like the leaves on the bent twig are still healthy. But a few days later, she's proven wrong. The damage causes the entire plant to wither and die. Something that could have easily been avoided if Yamada had just broken off the damaged parts. I think the associations, the implications are clear here, right? And what's more, the narrative never really shows that Yamada has anything to offer Mayama either. Yes, she's likable, but the manga doesn't give us a sign that she could ever fulfill one of Mayama's character needs. What I mean by this becomes clearer, I think, when I compare Yamada's situation to the other love triangle in the series. Takemoto is the first friend Hagu ever makes, and we're shown how he cares for her when she's overwhelmed by stress and social anxiety. And on the flip side, Takemoto's shortcomings prompt Hagu's first growth in the series. And Morita, meanwhile, is the only person who stands on equal footing with Hagu as an artist. His work inspires her and drives her to greater heights. So even though neither of these relationships ever materialize, and the manga actually emphasizes that both of these guys can't really fulfill Hagu's character needs, 
were at least given valid reasons why Hagu could conceivably see something in either of them and why they might make Hagu better as a person. But in Yamada's case, we never really get anything like that. And I think that's actually an important point. Everything about the way Yamada holds onto her love for Mayama is meant to feel fruitless and unhealthy, no matter how sympathetic she might seem in her struggles. And in truth, Yamada's love for Mayama is hollow if you look a bit deeper. Because it's not so much her feelings herself that stop her from moving on, but rather the fear that if she falls for someone else, all these feelings she's had for Mayama might just seem like a lie. Over time, she started considering her unrequited love for Mayama as a fundamental part of her identity. And that's the reason that she actually deep inside wants to keep wallowing in self-pity for years to come, maybe to never give up, so to prove to Mayama just how strong her feelings actually were. All this forms a very stark contrast actually to Mayama's love for Rika, because unlike Yamada's self-centered affections, Mayama persists, at least in parts, because he understands that Rika actually needs someone to lean on after the death of her husband. All this time, Rika has been fueled by this single-minded drive. She's going to finish what she and Harada had started, and then she'll join her love on the other side. Rika's trauma is deeper than most anyone can fathom. And as a result, she actually desperately needs someone to come onto her really strongly, to watch over her around the clock. You know, simply put, if it weren't for Mayama, Rika would not have survived for the end of the story. It's only through him that she eventually gives life another chance. In this light, it's quite interesting actually that among all the main characters, Mayama is the one who goes through the least amount of change. He sets his sights on a concrete goal at the start of the series, and by the end, he seems to attain it or at least to get closer to it. This is also highlighted by the way that Honey and Clover parallels Mayama and Nomiya. When we first get to know Nomiya, he's presented as basically this cooler, more successful version of Mayama. Nomiya is this real chick magnet, and he's the kind of guy who can throw a phone filled with numbers of women who are into him into Tokyo Bay like it's nothing. At one point, Mayama even admits that Nomiya is his ideal future self. And for Nomiya, the sight of Mayama is like being confronted with his cringeworthy past. So with all this, Honey and Clover suggests that this will be the destination of Mayama's character arc. That by the end of the story, he will transform from a creepy stalker into a cool, nonchalant guy like Nomiya. But as the story progresses, the manga actually subverts our expectations. We don't see Mayama becoming more like Nomiya, but Nomiya becoming more like Mayama. As it turns out, these characteristics that made Nomiya seem so cool, his detached nature, the way he doesn't hang on to relationships or memories, that's actually a severe character flaw. And as his love for Yamada deepens, he finds himself falling short in comparison with Mayama. Nomiya has to learn how to be honest about his feelings and how to commit to a relationship properly. In other words, that everything that he dismissed as embarrassing and cringy is actually what will allow him to fulfill his romantic desires and make him a better person in the process. And ironically, a better person means more like Mayama. So in a rather unexpected way, the only crush from the start of this series that comes to fruition is the most unsettling one. Mayama persisted in incredibly fucked up ways, and yet he did so to save someone's life. That's the way how his story contributes to answering the manga's central question. When is it worth holding on to something, and when should you let go? There's this scene around the middle of the story where Yamada consults Professor Hanamoto on the college rooftop 
about this very question. How can she convince someone who loves her to give up? Hanamoto tells her to be honest with them, and that then it's up to them how they will respond. Basically, they've only got two choices, to give up or to keep trying regardless. But Hanamoto is holding back some of the truth here. Remember, Hanamoto is this lonely man, unable to process the death of his dearest friend for years upon years. Hanamoto is a person who at times gets hit by a tsunami of anguish and desolation. And so, he's keenly aware that there's always a third choice when the going gets rough. The camera pans out, giving us a shot from the rooftop down to the ground. But right before that, we see Hanamoto walking away, with his back towards the roof, his arms around his niece and his laughing students. Despite everything, this broken, lonely man is embracing his tether to life and doing his best to keep moving forward, one step at a time.